This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast. Recently, a London, England magazine asked the question, what is home? And here are some of the answers they received from their readers across England. One said, home, a world of strife shut out, a world of love shut in. Another said, home, the place where the small are great and the great are small. Home, the father's kingdom, the mother's world, the child's paradise. Home, the place where we grumble the most, wrote one, but are treated the best. Another said, home, the center of our affections, round which our heart's best wishes twine. Home, the place where our stomachs get three square meals a day and our hearts a thousand. And finally, someone wrote, home is the only place on earth where the faults and failings of humanity are hidden under the sweet mantle of charity. The home at its best is humankind at its best. For this very world was created to be one family. You are loved. You are accepted. God is your father. Human beings are your brothers and sisters. Jesus of Nazareth himself taught this lucidly, clearly. In the J.B. Phillips translation, Jesus says at one point, the scribes and the Pharisees teach the Mosaic law, so you must do what they tell them and follow their instructions, but you must not imitate their lives, he said, for they preach, but they do not practice. They pile up back-breaking burdens and lay them on other men's shoulders, yet they themselves will not lift a finger to shift them. Their whole lives are planned with an eye to effect. They increase the size of their phylacteries. Phylacteries were strips of parchment inscribed with texts from the law worn on the arm and forehead. They increase the size of their phylacteries, Jesus said, and lengthen the tassels of their robes. They love seats of honor at dinners and front places in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in public places and to have men call them rabbi. But Jesus said, don't ever be called rabbi. You have only one teacher, and all of you are brothers. Or as another translation renders it, ye are all brethren. And don't call any human being father, said Jesus. You have one father, and he is in heaven. God is your father, you are brothers and sisters in one great family of God. To feel at home in this world, to know you're here for a purpose, to know God has a plan for this planet and a purpose for your human life is the beginning of the most exhilarating, joyous adventure you can possibly imagine. If you will pray for God's will, and Jesus taught to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. That God's plans, God's purposes be executed upon this earth, and you can be part of carrying that out. That aligns and synchronizes your mind, your will, your plans and purposes with the mind, the will, the plan, and the purposes which created this very universe of universes, this very star-spangled galaxy. The one who created all that is your father and your friend, and you can come to know God, not merely know about God, but know God and have a sense of concourse, of daily interaction, and abiding fellowship, and you can be at peace with God, knowing that God cares for you, that your eternal survival is assured, that you have nothing to worry about for all the rest of eternity because you're in the hands of the living God. The older I grow, said Thomas Carlyle, and now I stand upon the brink of eternity. The more comes back to me the sentence in the catechism which I learned when a child, and the fuller and deeper its meaning becomes. What is the chief end of man, it is written, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. God is enjoyable. God is a joy to know. God is a delight if you learn to have concourse, interaction, fellowship with God, you will discover it is the source of the greatest possible delight you have ever known. God is the very essence of being and reality. This is not some figment of my imagination or of yours. This is real. God really does exist. God really does have a will for you. God really does love you. You can know that love of God if you will open yourself to it. You can't know the love of another person here on earth, another physical being, unless you open yourself, your heart, your soul, your mind to the love of that person. Similarly, you can't know the love of God. You can't experience it feelingly unless you will open yourself, have the faith, have the trust in this moment to dare to believe that the God who created all that is, the architect of time and space, 
could really love you and does really love you. That is the source of the greatest possible joy. Jesus said, I have come that my joy might be in you and your joy might be complete. The great composer, Franz Joseph Haydn, told a friend on one occasion that at the very thought of God, his heart leaped for joy and he couldn't help it if his music did the same, if his music reflected that joy. There is joy in knowing God. Joy can coexist even with sorrow. You could lose a friend or a family member. Someone could die. Yet you could still possess within you, strange as it may seem, that joy which is born of the finding and knowing of God. Nothing material, nothing earthly can touch the joy of knowing God, of knowing God cares for you. The actress Irene Dunn once said, trying to build the brotherhood of man without the fatherhood of God would be like trying to make a wheel without a hub. Quite utterly unthinkable. The fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man are inextricably linked together in the teachings of Jesus. You cannot blissfully recline basking in the fatherhood of God, knowing you're loved by God, and let that be the end of it. No, there must be the melding of these two, the joining of these two together so that you see the entire planet as one family of God. J.G. Holland has written, God gives every bird its food, but he does not throw it into the nest. When you're in danger of smashing your boat as you row downstream, according to one old Indian proverb, call on God, but row away from the rocks. In other words, let your religion, let your faith be active. Don't assume that God is going to do everything for you, but act. Jesus said, my father works and I work also. Blessed is he who does the will of God, said Jesus. He who knows the will of God and obeys it actually puts it into practice, makes it part of his or her life. So it becomes a dynamic principle which motivates your every moment of existence, that you're filled, you're brimming, you're awash with the love of God, with mercy, forgiveness, with positive attitudes in any situation, no matter how hopeless things may appear, that you can have the cheerful joy of the individual who knows God, who knows he or she is a son or daughter of God, and that transcends any predicament, any circumstance, any problem, any vicissitude in which you may find yourself. God's will for you is unique. It is for you. It is personal. God's eternal plan for the universe includes a plan for your growth and your service through all eternity. This is not merely the systematic adherence to commandments. This is the starting point, but as we grow in our personal relationships with God, God's guidance becomes more and more personal to us. God has given each one of us a unique personality. God is our loving parent and our guide on the adventure of eternal universe service. And the adventure has already begun. You're in the midst of it. Right now, you can experience the profound joy of contacting God and the soul satisfaction of doing God's will. But you must learn to be patient while the joy of contacting the Father is immediate. Lasting satisfaction of soul develops only over the passage of time as you increasingly follow God's inner leading. You come to recognize it. You have a jeweler's eye for detecting the real will of God in your prayer life, in your mental life. You come to know God's will through consistent prayer and worship. You can pray in any situation, driving along in a car, stopping at a stop sign, brushing your teeth, washing the dishes. You can have a constant dialogue with God. Remember that prayer is a two-way conversation. Share your inner life with God, your thoughts, your concerns, problems, questions, your hopes. Pray honestly. Pray the way you really feel. Pray with the confidence that God is your closest friend, and then listen while the Father illuminates, organizes, and shows you the significance of your mortal existence. And listen with your whole being, your body, your mind, your spirit, and your soul. Then in worship, simply relax your earthly concerns. Direct the inner gaze heavenward. Express to God the love and the trust that you feel for God. Worship yields the peace which passes all understanding. It is togetherness with God. It is the peace of God, fulfillment of human relationships, illumination of destiny. It is time-striking step with the eternal 
march of the ages and the will of God. Be you perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect, said Jesus. That was his supreme commandment. That sums it all up. Obeying this begins with your wholehearted desire to know the will of God for your life and proceed with your dynamic dedication to do God's will every moment you live. That is the beginning of the great adventure of human life. Living, truly living up to what you are, to your birthright as a son or daughter of God, loved, infinitely loved. And if you'll have the faith to believe it this instant, that all can begin for you right here and right now. Write to us, will you? At the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell that mailing address. Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Denham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.